Hello everybody. Hello. Right, so R7RS. And these slides are by John Caron, who is the chair of the R7RS Working Group 2. He can't be here today, so he sent me to speak in his stead, but to spare you from me being somebody reading through some slides up here when we could have just sent you an email, I'll try and embellish it with my own opinion and recollections and background. But I must stress that words you see written up here are the words of John Cowan, Working Group 2 Chair, and are probably more true than words that come from my mouth, which are the opinion of some random guy from a mailing list. So, oh, next slide. There, right. So, r 7 rs for those who aren't familiar, the scheme specification standard, so much as it is, goes through revisions. This is the revised, 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 rev oh, I lose count, how that many times, seven times revised report on the programming language scheme. So obviously we came after R6RS. But when R6RS came out, there was a lot of controversy about it. People didn't like it for various reasons. Some people loved it, and so there was a bit of war, which was unfortunate for scheme. So when R7RS, the steering committee, were deciding what to do and people discussing plans for this, we looked back at this and said, OK, so R5RS was too small. There wasn't, what we mean by programs are not portable enough is that there, it lacked certain key features, particularly a module system that people wanted. And so if people wanted to write portable modules using just R5RS, there wasn't a way. You had to use the module system of your native environment um, in implementation rather, and so then when people wanted to move their modules to other schemes, they had to change them. This wasn't good. We wanted more standardization than that. But when R6RS came out, a big criticism of it from many, not all, was that R6RS was too large. It made too many demands on existing implementations. For instance, you needed you know the full numeric tower and all sorts of things like that. Um, people didn't like the structure of how um, records were handled and so on and so forth and this meant that lots of the interesting implementations that Scheme is famous for, fun little things people write themselves in a weekend, couldn't support R6RS or couldn't without making big sacrifices that move them away from where they wanted to be going. So how do we find a happy middle ground between those two? Well instead of trying to do that the steering committee decided to split Scheme into two languages. Now that sounds pretty scary, it's not as scary as that. So. It's not like a sideways split, like, you know, here's C and here's Scheme. It's sort of a horizontal split into layers. So the bottom layer is R7RS small, much closer to sort of R5RS and how it feels, so almost entirely compatible with R5RS. But added, carefully selected additional features, things we needed. Portable libraries was the main focus there. And, um, yeah, so R6RS, one of the things that people did like about it was the library system, so we take pretty much close to that. And yeah, you can sort of summarise working group one, the small R7RS, as being R5RS plus modules. There's a few other minor details, we won't go into them here. But in mid-2013, that was voted and ratified and so on, and now you can download PDFs a bit. Hooray! And there are implementations, we can talk about that later. So, um, in R7RS, small libraries. So they subdivide R5RS, the um, sort of core bindings that R5RS provides. We chop them into a number of standard libraries, and this meant that you could have an ultra small scheme that would say, I support R7RS small, but only these libraries. You could say, right, I'm missing out some of these features. And so it's you know, like a sort of a subset implementation. And so this meant we could pull out things like Unicode, for instance, and formalize a numeric tower and so on. And so this is the list of the um, R7RS small libraries in there, middle button I'm told. So here, yeah, base, case lambda, char, which is all the exciting Unicode stuff, complex numbers, can't remember what CXR was, eval, file IO, inexact numbers, a few lazy operations and things, and so on and so forth. Um, so all the existing R7RS implementations support the whole of the small language. So, that was finished, done and dusted. Time came to move on to R7RS large. So the idea of this is to then please the people who wanted to have a large standard base. Because having you know, a small language, great, it's easy for lots of people to implement it in their little toy schemes and get implementations off the ground and so on. On the other hand, you had the people saying, I want to you know, actually write cool programs and maybe get a job doing this kind of thing. I need a language that has batteries included, lots of libraries, does all sorts of brilliant stuff. So R7RS large is living up to the name. R7RS enormous. It will subsume R6RS and a lot of the functionality that you find in the standard libraries of Common Lisp and so on but not in an upward compatibility way. I hear breath in drawn there. Um, and yeah, because it's such a large project basically, it's been split into sort of separate modules as it were, and these are being released in series. So we focus on a bunch of things in a turn, you know, decide what sort of standard libraries we'd like to have in that area, 
formalize them, vote on them, get them out the door. And so spectrum colored return refers to the fact that sort of the red edition is the first set to come out to cover sort of data structures things. We'll get onto that in a moment. And then we'll work on all the different colors of the rainbow. And um, yes, it means we have things we can start to work on rather than waiting for the entire thing to be finished. So red edition is done, orange edition is in progress. Yes, sir. Are going to make a surface for the libraries so that... Uh... Um, kind of. I'll get onto the process there. It's more the other way around. The libraries are based on surfies. Okay, good. So the process. So our seven R is small. The process that followed was okay. Let's start with R five R S. Ticket by ticket, we voted on things, decided what to do, and then vote on the whole result. So it's okay. Large is being assembled surfy by surfy. So for a given area. So in red, we're looking at data structures and things. We're looking at the existing surfies for features people want. Writing new ones if there aren't ones already. Generally in a conservative manner, not going out and doing wonderful flights of research, but looking at sort of things that are out there that haven't really been standardized, looking at de facto standards and trying to bring them together and produce surfies. So they're going through the surfie process. And so each edition of R7RS is then basically a set of surfies snapshotted and then to be stuck into a PDF together you can download. Um, there's a lot of voting involved in this. And so the ballot is open to the whole community. When we say, right, you know, we want to have mutable cells or something. Anybody who's interested, write a surfy for your amazing new way of doing mutable cells. Not there's many variations on that, but there you go. And then come ballot time, we say, right, we want to put together the red edition. So here are the options that people have submitted for doing their mutable cells. Have a nice vote, see which one you like. And yeah, as it says, there's options to abstain or vote no library saying, I don't like any of these. We should start again from scratch and think of something better. And so surveys get accepted, majority of votes, including the edition, and then we start on the next edition. Unlike with the core language, we don't need a sort of final community vote on the whole thing, so we just voted on the sections, and the sections are, in theory, sort of much more orthogonal and separate, whereas, of course, in the core of a language, you need it to fit together in a sensible way, which is why that final vote existed. I don't know the significance of this Middle Eastern proverb that John has included on these slides, but the dogs bark, but the caravan moves on. Sounds quite poetic, so let's just leave it at that. <laughs> anyway, so red edition. Adds many new data structures that are standard in other programming languages but have never been standardized in Scheme. And I find myself I occasionally have to write Python for work, and for some reason, whenever I write Python, I use their set types a lot in mutable sets and things. I've always sorely missed having them in a sort of nice standard way in Scheme, so we're working on that. So um, it includes many well loved surfies in their entirety, of course, and modifies a few to fit in. Because we want it, of course, to be consistent. Obviously, we want to use the R7 R a small. Um, you know, library system, we wanted to sort of, some things had to be slightly renamed for consistency and all that kind of thing. Because we do want to create, you know, one language that looks like it fits together rather than a big mess. So yes, Red Edition was voted on in 2016. Basic libraries in there. Lists, Surfy 1, that should be no surprise to anybody. But we had vectors, so the modification of Surfy 133 for memory it was a while ago now was mainly, um, I think, some of the argument orders of things were just inconsistent with sort of vector maps and vector folds were just slightly different to how they were in Surfy 1. Thought it would be good to rename a bunch of those, um, sorry, reorder a bunch of those to make them consistent. Sorting, similarly, sets and bags, hooray, character sets, got old Surfy 14, and hash Just tables. Is, yes? Is the Surfy 32 sorting that's uh, Lane Sievers short? Oh, I can't remember, to be honest. Yeah, let me, let me. Look it up. Assuming yeah, you've got the Wi Fi working in here. And of course, we have a Surfy expert in the corner who might remember some of these things. He's smiling at me, Riley. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, hash tables, there's a lot of controversy about hash tables throughout, yeah, throughout the standardization, mainly because um, from memory, Surfy 69 depended upon sort of EQ hash tables existing for implementations with garbage collectors that um, move things around. That can be difficult to do efficiently. We also have included some tools for immutability and laziness. So I had immutable lists, which is a favorite of mine. I think Scheme has a little bit too much mutability for my tastes. Random access immutable lists. This refers to um, the sort of purely functional data structures where it's easy to pull out. You know, it's not linear. It's not um, OWN time to find particular elements and things. Dex double-ended queues, immutable text, which is a generalization of strings. Um, much criticism for the sort of core scheme string with um, string set which puts certain uh, constraints on implementations that want to do Unicode with a full character set. Um, generators, lazy sequences, and streams, all that kind of useful stuff we know and love. Got our mutable boxes, least controversial thing ever. List backed queues and ephemerons, which from memory uh, to do with um, sort of weak references, I think. I can't remember. Does anyone remember what ephemerons on? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah exactly weak it. references. Cool. I didn't have much to do with that. Anyway, 
So now work is afoot on the orange edition. The theme here, numerical operations. And there'll be a few things that leaked out of the red edition because they weren't um, conclusively voted on in the original votes. What follows is preliminary. So, integer division operations. Why on earth is that in a large language rather than part of the coin, you might wonder. The reason there is because there's lots of different ways of saying what, um, how you sort of define quotient and remainder when you have negative numbers and so on. Most languages seem to just pick one and go with it, but um, there's been much debate on this. You have all the sort of different do you round up or round down and so on and so forth. Bitwise operations, fixed nums, many of the sort of performance hackers as I'm aware, explicit flow nums. Nice thing about that is that sort of being based on the C library, that means the math.h sort of, you know, you have the error function and log minus 1p and all that kind of thing coming through, which is useful for people doing numerical computation requiring some accuracy. Standard ways of generating random numbers, testing for primality and so on. Um, homogeneous numeric vectors, like good old SRI 5.4. I'm not sure what the competition about there is. Integer sets, descriptive statistics, decel structs, etc. Multi-dimensional arrays. Now there's a certain amount of competition about this because there's a few ways of doing them. Yeah, as you can see, generalized arrays, computed contents, heterogeneous, homogeneous, bit arrays, lazy and eager array operations. You can see the theme here. Proper enumerations. Um, sort of a bit like how they're done in Java here. We have unique objects with a name, an order, and a value. Um, yeah, basically the presence of the ordinals in those is for useful for various performance hacks. You can use sort of integer sets to deal with them rapidly and so on. Put them into groups, blah, 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 blah. Vote on those. Ah, good old string formatting. So there's two approaches for doing this. Templates, like printer for formatting common lisp, and combinators like um, or Alex Shin's FMT library where well, I rather prefer the latter, but you have sort of a series of basically higher order procedures to build up like the opposite of parser combinators. Um, as the slide says, everybody knows templates, but when you have this nasty embedded sub-language embedded in strings, you can't necessarily extend it and it's com complicated to learn. Combinators are rather fancy. That's my vote. Mm -hmm. Right, and the leftovers from red, so string libraries, there was a lot of debating about that. It's quite contentious. Mutable immutable maps, sets and bags of ordered elements, regular expressions, oh, that kind of worms. Right, yellow edition, the next one, is going to be about control flow. So we're going to pull out useful macros and things, low-level macro package. That I'm sure there's going to be a wonderful conversation about which one to go for there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that one's going to come out. I, I predict there'll be a lot of bun throwing. Um, since I... scheme is this discussion? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, development will get to that point and then sort of, you know, it will never terminate. <laughs> you know, this equals bottom. <laughs> Syntax parameters, named function arguments, Good old pattern matching, ah, oh, loops, many choices to be had there as well. Conditions and restarts, moderately contentious there. Generic excesses and mutators, that will probably be a bit of a showing generalized set, hopefully. Green edition, we're going to do all the exciting non-portable stuff. It'll take a lot of work. So, file I.O., more than just our very simple, you know, with input from file and so on. Things which are sort of closer to platform and facilities. POSIX timers, environments, REPL hooks, non-file ports, system commands, and so on and so forth. That's always messy to standardize that kind of thing because a lot of programming languages generally kind of assume POSIX is the underlying platform, but with mobile platforms becoming more and more predominant, they're not quite such a POSIX environment. So yeah, I'll be interested to see what comes up whenever that comes around. Blue edition, complex and controversial, as if choosing a low-level macro system wasn't. <laughs> time types, time conversions, binary O. See, why is that controversial? I, don't know, I think that's easy. <laughs> Character set conversions, URIs, path names, trees, blah, blah, blah. A lot of that, I imagine, they'll be off the shelf. So if he's in sort of prior art, we can use by then, hopefully. And then ultraviolet. <laughs> Completely invisible at present. Unified lexical syntax for all the data structures. So, you know, the idea with that is that have all these sort of wonderful decks and sets and things and so on, but there isn't necessarily a way to, you know, pass them through write and read. It would be nice to standardize that sort of thing so you can have them as literals in your source code and communicate them between processes more easily. Anyway, somebody asked on RC, when is R7RS coming out? Reastrid, Taylor Campbell said, as soon as the top is a beautiful golden brown and if you stick a toothpick in it, the toothpick comes out dry. Basically, it'll be ready when it's ready. 
because we're releasing these things in these sort of coloured slices, it takes a bit of the pressure off. You know, we release each layer of things based on a kind of priority ordering. You know, people wanted data structures done quickly. We can sort of get these things out there. People can start building their implementations and growing their implementations with time. And so, yes, it may take some time to finish the process. Quite possibly, sort of R8 RS will come along and have a new lower level small language while working to group two is still continuing. I don't know, we'll see about that. Certainly these two sort of stranger development could continue independently. Right, what can you guys, the wonderful public of the Lisp community, do? Certainly we need more SURFI processes and implementations implementing those SURFIs to have a go and actually try these things. Way more specifications than code actually supporting them right now. So write some code, implement these things, and new specifications are still very welcome. I'll emphasize that, very, very welcome. The more, you know, Many of these sort of votes you went through in the uh, red edition, you know, there weren't that very many options to choose between. More options would be nice. And as he says, let a hundred flowers bloom, and then a few of them will survive, and they'll be nice and not the thistles. Any questions? Oh, we're in for time. Yes, sir. So, if uh, tomorrow you, you have uh, you vote for some string library, and next year you find, oh, there's a better string library, will you go for something like, we're going to deprecate the old one and add on the new one, or both will be standardized, or what do you Interesting question. I mean, in um, working group one, the small scheme, you know, we looked at things like mutability of pairs, set car and set color, and thought, well, you know, it would be nice to be deprecating that at some point in the future. We didn't feel quite brave enough to say, let's not include that in our 7RS, and, you know, due to our charter and so on, we kind of had to be quite similar to R5RS in certain ways, but nonetheless, we sort of push them off into libraries with a view to make it easier for implementations to not implement them in a sort of standardized way by not providing that library, but they could still provide all the others and claim compliance with those. So, um, yeah, we'll see how bold the um, sort of um, charter for R8 RS is. I think given the political situation when we started, we had to be, you know, we couldn't go deprecating things we didn't like, basically. And so, yeah, in future, well, I think certainly with, um, you know, the large language, with lots and lots of libraries, it'll be a lot easier to be introducing new and old versions of things and slowly deprecating the old ones. But this will be done with some sensitivity to existing things. Oh, who goes first? All right, is this going to be under the RNRS namespace, the core library space? Uh, uh, the library names generally say sort of scheme something, rather than okay. R7RS no, because something. Because asking where, where to put it, because, you know, like, there is already R7RS small supporting variables, so mm -hmm. now, now okay, it's R7RS, so <coughs> you know, when it started yeah. implementing the, the large libraries. I think from memory the decision was made to call all the libraries scheme something rather than R7RS something, purely because as we go through future revisions we then have lots of numbers flying around and it get confusing. Yes? Uh, another elephant in the room there. There was a great technology invented in the 70s called object-oriented programming. Uh, and I, all your libraries are desperately monomorphic, and uh, which is better than no standard at all, but um, not always the way people like to write code. Mm, indeed. No generic functions or anything like that listed in there, are there? Okay. Yes, yeah, so I haven't heard much discussion about those. Um, yeah, can you remember any? Decisions about why we're not doing much about those, Arthur? Welcome, sir. Mm. Yeah, so I suppose... Not enough people offering proposals. Yeah, I suppose it is a bit of a can of worms to open that one. It's, it's good to get the monomorphic ones in in the first place, and then you can abstract over them. Yeah. And certainly, you know, it's... It would be possible... I mean, it, the, the specifications as written don't necessarily preclude the extensibility of things like PLOS being extensible through some implementation defined or later standardized mechanism. Which is one of the beauties of scheme. Of course I could say, who needs object orientation? We have closures. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, sir. All right, so what's going to be in R10 RS? You know, so what are the ah. things that you know, had you political expediency decide you or the other people in the committee been willing to dump old stuff or put in things that really are radical, not just binary mm -hmm. old stuff, but like truly radical, what would go in? Well, personally, getting down to opinion rather than speaking for anybody else here, I would have much less mutability in scheme, I think, string set, set car and set Kodara. Terrible millstones, and you might say, you know, what harm does set car do? But when you look at something like you have a, yeah. Lambda with an improper argument list, and so you get a list of all the results that 
irritations to compilers when you know that list is potentially mutable can be quite frustrating and the irritations to people trying to prove the correctness or indeed any properties of their programs when lists they pass around to you know procedures that in theory just return the length of a list or something might mutate some bits of it and so on are, are pretty messy so yes I'd like to see a lot less mutability I would like to see generic functions in because I think they're a nice way of doing object orientation much rather those than class based um, Delimited continuations? Yeah, del ah, yes, that's a good one. Delimited continuations are nice as well. Certainly, you know, semantically they are more well, strictly, uh, well, strictly equally powerful to the ordinary continuations because you can implement one in terms of the other, but it's nicer to implement call CC in terms of partial continuations than vice versa. So on that grounds, I'd say they're a superior replacement. Yeah, that'd be a good one as well. Well, why isn't that in large? I'd assume that would be in large. I think just too soon. To be honest, I'm. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's enough consensus really across implementations in actually having partial continuations. I don't know. There's still some time to go, so I think people can propose it from the later levels. Certainly, it sounds the kind of thing that would fall into blue or ultraviolet quite happily. I guess I could turn that around to the floor. What would you guys like to see in R8 RS? Existence? Yeah, oh, that'd be good. <laughs> I know. No, I actually, I, I don't want to see any more scheme standards. I unpopular opinion. Mm, I think, well, I think we're good enough. Uh, so, what's the deal with race continuum? That's uh, that's been bagging me for a long time because it's impossible to implement in Gambit without making some really hard changes internally. So basically, the the specification of race continuum kind of assumes that if you have the previous exception handler available when yeah. you're defining your exception handler. <laughs> Which is kind of like puts, you know, like some restrictions on the implementation, which might not keep it around. Mm, in this I can't remember, to be honest. I remember there being discussion about that, but I can't remember where it came to. Yeah, because that's uh, that, that guy is uh, nasty. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Are there any last questions or comments? Can Can I ask Andy to elaborate a little bit on why you don't want to see more? Because I, I I don't find them useful, and, and I'm not even hearing a lot of demand from my users for R7 RS even, just some, you know. Uh, but R5 RS seems to be fine for that kind of code. R6 RS was very good, and it looks like at the end of this process you're going to end up with R6 RS, right? And then if you did end up with R6 RS, like you mentioned, you know, like it's that, that's that's. If you ended up with that, then what would be the point of the whole process? I don't agree with uh, with the beginning of the story that you know we alienated people with our six RS, and so they, then we made a compromise. I think that this compromise does not include racket, and it does not include uh, shade, and does not really include guile. Although we will, if you know, whatever we need to, uh, depending on user demands. But ultimately, I we, I'm more inspired by. Um, Extensions made by particular implementations, um, and, I, and I don't see them. I'm too pessimistic, I, I, and I apologize for that. <laughs> but the, the bright points I see are, are in implementations and not standards. Yeah, I mean, I think what I would say to that is that, to a certain extent, the kind of purpose of the standard is to create something that is common across implementations, which, you know, to a certain extent, will be okay. Find the lowest common denominator. What will work in anything? But if you just do that, you know, that's rather limiting. So, yeah, where we sort of propose things which aren't already in all implementations, but we say they should or they could easily be done so, it's supposed to be a sort of relatively non-controversial non way of ensuring commonality across implementations. But, you know, we also don't want to be, you know, going away and doing lots and lots of research and coming up with a really cool model and saying, hey, scheme, this is how you're going to work from now on implementations, catch up. You know, that's not the way to do it. Exactly. Wait, what's wrong with that? Yeah, I actually serious like question. That. Yeah, like Racket has done this, and and yet because of the way the scheme standard works, it's no longer a scheme, right? Whereas I would prefer for scheme to include Racket and include like uh, basically going off and you know doing your own experimentation. Yeah, what's consistent I mean, to you and your users? I'd say to me, Racket is still a scheme inside. I mean, there's been a change there, it might not necessarily then, you know, comply with the standard or so on, but it's still very much conceptually. As long as you think like C++ is C, it's fine. <laughs> right. I mean, that's not a good thing. Well, then, you know, I think something to maybe keep in mind is that the original scheme standard 
was created not so people could run Scheme on all their different systems, so because people couldn't even read the Scheme code because the, the implementations had diverged so much. So that was kind of a much lower bar. Mm. Uh, but I think it reflected an interesting diversity in all features, right? Mm. And so, yeah. yeah. So that, that's an interesting point. So maybe, maybe we need to get to that point before we really need another standard. Just can't even read each other's but, code. But surely this is a dialectic as well, and I do look at surveys when I implement, and you know, for ideas. So like, it's not like this, this work is is useless. But I I, I question the um, the canonicity of the line of scheme as represented by the RNIs process. I feel like things have diverged, and we should not uh, bless a single head anymore. I, I feel like we should uh, share this you know root of uh, development and the extent that we uh, converge in the future, it should be based on our, uh, what different branches inspire us. Yes, I think there is some truth in that. But I think, you know, a standard can provide cohesion to the community, I guess, in two different ways. One is sort of in the sort of strict, you know, if the code complies, the standard will run anywhere, blah, 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 sort of thing, which then, you know, is good, but on the other hand, it means that the sun standard has to be to some extent a subset, and so a lot of interesting code can't be written in it and so on. There's that, but also on the other hand, you know, purely by saying, okay, let's sort of scrape everything together and call it one thing that everyone else looks at, that then becomes a sort of communication ground of concepts in a way. So it says, okay, you know, other implementations are welcome to do crazy and exciting things, but where there's no reason for them to deviate from a particular standard, why not go with it? So more is consistent. I mean, um, you know, as we were discussing over lunch, you know, I mess around with chicken scheme in my fair time. Great. But um, <laughs> Geeks is based on Kyle, and so, you know, it would be very easy for me as a chicken hacker to go and start playing around with that because it's kind of basically the same language, and there's all sorts of changes in various areas, but, you know, I can look at the code and get the gist of what's going on, and I might not recognize some standard library calls and things, but I'll know what Lambda and Con do. And so I hope, you know, even sort of racket, kind of diverging in theory more than that and not calling itself scheme anymore. Nonetheless, when I say I still sort of feel it's like a scheme inside, I can look at the code and I see lambdas and cons and you haven't decided to rename lambda to bottle moose or something. You know, why would you? It, it, Although you could call it FN. <laughs> right. It's not that bad. <laughs> so I want to disagree with the idea that uh, at the end of all this it'll just be R6, because R6 was much smaller than the ambitions for R7 uh, large. Sockets and all kinds of other things that, that go in that R6 or in that list. You can use so. a fiber sockets, pretty neat buffer for PLT and developer. We can bit. I have an opinion on that. I spent the last uh, 10 years uh, writing code supporting um, portable command list programs on over maybe 15 different implementations. Um, it was a lot of pain. Uh, was worth something, I think. I don't know how much, or if it was worth a pain, but I think it was worth something. Um, indeed, there are a lot of programs you can write that do not require particular text or opinion recording uh, continuations or object systems or whatever. And there's no reason to write this code 10 times or 20 times one per implementation when it could hopefully be shared. And hopefully, we can write code that keeps the non portable parts to where it ought to be, a uh, small part of your program that already is non portable. Mm. I think there's value in more cooperation. In the places which are not innovation, right, yes. you, you, you standardize. The places where you're trying to do innovation, you can't standardize yet, you have to figure things out. So it, it sort of naturally breaks down. The standard shouldn't be innovative. Racket and dial and chicken should. And the standard has to keep catch up to provide a name to what's been developed by different implementations. I have to make an admission is that I already registered to be part of our seven RS, but I never did anything. Because when I registered, I had the um, confused notion that indeed that, that was where some um, innovation could happen that I was interested in. But indeed, the standard is not for innovation, it's for. Uh, Making people agree on the easy stuff so they can they can kind of not waste time on the easy stuff. So if there is no innovation in in, in scheme, the name. Yes. Why are we having a workshop about it? No, 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 serious no, no, question. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's not it's not that there's no innovation in scheme. It's, it's no innovation in the stand. Right. There there are a thousand flowers blooming, 
each with its own innovation, and the standard tries to catch up. Okay, so the scheme then is not the mm. standard. I said that the clues in there is the revised report on the language scheme. Sure. It's more like sort of you know the Oxford English Dictionary documenting what English is. Then why isn't the scheme workshop following the scheme community? It is. Yes. People are giving talks about innovative new things they're doing in the scheme. And there seems to be a giant divide in half the community right now. Are you talking about the More than usual. Yeah. Yes. I mean that's one of the, that's probably the most prolific one, but. Like, how many dial users are here? I, I don't know. Some people use this. I'm using four ones. Okay, so we got we got a guy. <laughs> I've used Gaia before. Yeah, I'm sure everyone has. Yeah, Pro probably half the people in this room at least have used Gaia at least. Oh yeah, okay, it might that. just be the racket yeah. people. But half the room is also used Gaia. Right yeah, true. <laughs> and the keynote was given by a racket person. Yes. Yeah, yes. Here now. And we'd all, I think, like to be able to use each other's implementations more. I'd like to be able to use the implementations more, but not at the cost of innovation and in implementations. To me, that's far more important than compatibility. Yeah. First, but yeah. the standard just isn't doing anything that will prevent innovation. Because that I'm not sure of, actually. Okay. I think the standards maybe have, have had some implications. So, for example, mutability is part of the standard, right? You have to support mutable. For set car set yeah, sure. stuff like that. Yeah. Isn't that part of the yeah. Yes. Which so is, if you had an implementation of scheme that didn't have mutability in it, that technically like racket, you know, like racket, 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 yeah. racket doesn't yeah. do it here anymore. I mean, isn't that why the racket group left? Like wasn't that the last straw? It's a, Maybe. It's a, I mean they're also yeah, macro. No, 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 no one no one ever told the rest of us why <laughs> <laughs> just happened. It's actually, there were a lot of reasons why. Oh, okay. I don't yeah, I don't think it's just one. But, but the, the, the point is, though, that like, if we are literally explicitly avoiding um, like innovations in the standard, which is a fine thing, it just sort of seems odd that the conference focus, or the workshop focuses on it. Which I would like this is always been our scheme standard. The scheme standard has never been about innovation, in my understanding. It's been, there are a bunch of different implementations. So, so scheme is arguably the most implemented language in history. and. Everyone writes a scheme and it has its own features, and at some point it's like, oh, well, there's a zillion versions, but everyone kind of agrees that this feature is an important one, so let's try to come together and see if there's a version of it that we can all Yeah, you know, scheme as a whole is a very big thing with lots of different threads in it, and then the report on the language scheme is, you know, a much smaller world that tries to follow behind this expanding shop front of amazing innovation that's occurring. I wonder if the rate of scheme implementation is even declining. <laughs> I'm interested to see new scheme implementation still popping up. I think it's really great. <laughs> there are kind of like both the last five years, let's say so, like the Ypsilon thing. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty new scheme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the very nature of what you're doing is not a report, right? The very nature of what you're doing is creating a standard. Like if you wanted to make a report, if you wanted to make a dictionary, you, you could do that. And, and by all means, you should. But the thing about dictionaries is, like, you want to eventually release them. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's not perfect, but that's okay, because that's when the next dictionary comes out. And again, it's not a standard so much as it's just a, this is what scheme is. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm just radical. Sorry. <laughs> radical is good. Dissenting voices, that's what the world needs. Otherwise, life would be boring. Yes, I don't know really. I mean, I haven't heard much talk yet about you know, what's next. Will there be an R8 RS or will R7 RS be mutable or something? I don't know. Who knows what the future will hold? Yeah. It'll be exciting. Yeah. At some level, why isn't R7 and RS small enough? Doesn't take the ability to do some of this cross communication between the different implementations already? Yes. Maybe Maybe R7 or is huge is... Yeah, I mean, if small really is designed to do that, it is sort of the minimal subset with you know, largely following the implementations and so on. So, why have large? That's what I kind of hear in that question, really. Yeah. Well, so, actually, the, one of the main reasons to have large is to be able to write non-trivial programs that can be ported across different implementations and work in the different implementations. 
that's one of the reasons that you, why you want to have a standard that has some libraries. Okay, so because you know like, there are people who are writing code that says, okay, this is baseline skin code, and we're implementing this, and I wanted this to work in as many implementations as possible without a standard. It says that at least we can use some data structures that are already there. It's not going to be possible. It's going to be the, the mess that for regular team with, uh, with maintaining ASDF and trying to reconcile the different list of implementations. So a standard is definitely useful. And even if it does constrain, you know, like certain things, okay, it's certainly useful. Yeah. You know, I want to be able to write code that uses set types and so on and so forth. I found myself doing some Python to do that in a portable manner. It certainly is a you know a hobbyist author of scheme code myself. I mean, really, when I come to write something, I'll design. Am I going to write this just as portable as an RS, or am I going to write it, you know, targeting different implementation? You know, what's the time for checking for things I do? And so, you know, if I'm writing a library that doesn't have the external dependencies, doesn't really depend on things like you know, foreign function interfaces and so on. With my value system, I'd rather write it as a sort of pure R7RS module and ship it out there so that people from all the implementations can use it if they want to. But on the other hand, if I want to write something that's sort of binding with C code and things, I'll go over to chicken it's what I know. And it'd be nice to be able to have that trade-off as a sort of possibility I can choose rather than you pick one or the other. Any more comments? All right, let's thank our speaker.